Welcome everyone to our October meeting of the Autism Consortium. Um, my name is Kate Thompson. I'm the Senior Administrative Program Coordinator of ACT-LEND. And uh, today we have Dr. Sandra Venegas speaking. Uh, Dr. Venegas is the Clinical Training Director of ACT-LEND. Uh, she is also the Research Director at Texas Center for Disability Studies. Um, and uh, is a research assistant professor at Steve Hicks School of Social Work. Uh, Dr. Venegas did her PhD in developmental psychology at Loyola University Chicago and completed a, a postdoctoral fellowship program at the LEND, at LEND program at the Ellen University of Illinois at Chicago. And so we, Dr. Venegas is going to speak to us toward the end of her presentation. Uh, about some of the projects she's currently working on, but today she will be speaking on examining overweight and obesity among Latino children with and without IDD. So I will turn this over to Dr. Venegas. Thank you, Kate. Um, I'm really excited to be here and sharing um, with everyone some of this research that I've been doing for a couple of years now. Um, so hopefully um, there will be some, some good questions and discussion towards the end. Um, so first, we um, before we get started, just wanted to share that the study was funded by the uh, National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research through a grant that we have, um, of which Dr. Morganya is the PI of. And then for learning objectives, um, we're hoping that once you complete viewing this presentation, you'll be able to define the criteria for overweight and obesity in children, that you'll be able to assess the impact of sociodemographic factors on overweight and obesity in children with and without IDD, and that you'll also be able to identify culturally informed strategies for addressing overweight and obesity among Latino children with and without IDD. So this is just how the um, presentation is structured. We'll talk a little bit about what overweight and obesity is, as well as some of the, um, um, the impact of overweight and obesity on children. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what we know about overweight and obesity in children and youth with IDD, um, and then think about how, um, how these issues impact the Latino community. I'll present on the current research study, including um, some of our, um, our results. And then finally, we'll conclude with some strategies on how we can um, address overweight and obesity among children and families. So feel free to um, put in questions in the chat and I'll try to get to them, um, but we may have to wait till the end to address your questions. Um, so what is overweight and obesity? Um, we might think we kind of have an idea, right? If we see it, we know it, um, or you might think we know it. Um, so a definition that's used by the World Health Organization is that is it an abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that presents a risk to health. So, um, so this is, I think this is important to think about because we are when we're thinking about or talking about overweight and obesity, it's important to reflect on what it what the impact is overall on the person's health. Um, when we think about children um, who are overweight or obese. We know that this is a pressing issue um, globally. We um, There's about 41 million children under age of five who are considered overweight or obese. And this number is much larger when we think about the older demographic of children between five and 19 years of age, um, where we see over 340 million children. Um, so this means that a lot of children globally are impacted um, by overweight and obesity. So why is this? a pressing issue. Um, well, we know that these rates have been increasing substantially in recent years, so it's not something that is stable over time, but rather we know that there's a larger percentage of children that are affected by overweight and obesity. So in this chart here, this just maps the, um, the trends, um, the increasing trends of children under five who are considered overweight and obese. So you'll see from the year 2000, there has been a very steady increase over the years. Um, another reason why overweight and obesity is a pressing concern is because we know that um, based on longitudinal studies that children who are overweight and obese tend to become adults who are overweight and obese. In fact, they're two times more likely to be overweight or obese um, in adulthood. 
So we know that those early healthy behaviors that are learned in childhood can persist. Um, so it's important to address um, these issues, especially if they're going to have an impact long term on the child's life. Furthermore, we also know that there is a significant social impact on overweight um, and obesity on children. Um, we know that overall there, is, there are high rates of stigma against um, individuals who are overweight and obese. There have been studies that have shown that there's lower quality of life that are reported by children who are overweight and obese, as well as their families. Um, long-term, we see that there are some of these issues can have a long-term impact on educational attainment. Um, and finally, we do see some impact on mental health where one study found that um, female children who were obese were more likely to demonstrate current sy symptoms of depression, as well as symptoms of um, demonstrate symptoms of depression later on in life as well. Um, and then we can think about more of the financial impact of overweight and obesity. Um, among adults who are overweight or obese, we know that um, there may be other related conditions or other chronic conditions that accompany the additional um, um, weight status. Um, and these are estimated to cost over $500 billion per year. Um, some of these expenses are due to um, treating and managing high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, diabetes. There's increased rates of hospitalization, as well as increased um, prescription drug use. And these are all compared to adults with, um, with healthy weight. So all of these when we think about all of these issues, it really highlights the need to address overweight and obesity early on so that we can minimize some of these um, risks that occur down the line. Um, not to mention that um, by addressing these earlier on, we can help, um, help children have greater quality of life, um, achieve greater um, educational um, progress, um, and overall just have um, um, greater well-being. Um, so given that we've talked a lot about what, um, what the impacts are of overweight and obesity among children and adults, um, I think it's important to think about how can we measure it? How do we know if someone is overweight and obese? How do we, what are some of the um, measures that are available? Um, so one of the most common measures um, for measuring overweight and obesity in children is our anthropometric measures. So these are basically uh, measures that are based on calculations on measuring um, either um, mass or length or height. Um, and these are typically much more widespread in their use in studies as well as in clinical settings, just because they're, um, there's less cost involved. There are other measures that are more um, invasive or more involve um, use of other x-ray machines and things like that. But those are um, tend to occur more often in clinical settings, um, whereas these measures are more often used in prevalence studies and research studies, as well as in smaller clinics who may not have access to um, larger, uh, larger machines. Um, so some of these measures include things like weight, height, body mass index, which we'll talk about next body circumference, so even measuring uh, someone's waist, measuring someone's um, arms, um, the waist to hip ratio, as well as head circumference. But the more common measure, um, at least for children, um, is body mass index. So when you look at prevalence studies on overweight and obesity, more than, more than likely they'll be reporting on body mass index. Um, and for children, it, there's a recognition that um, we must take into account the child's age and sex because we know that children develop and grow at different rates. So a child of a certain weight, um, you know, would um, be very different than an older child of that same weight, right? So in terms of what we would expect developmentally for that child would be different. Um, so when we think about, when we look at the calculation for BMI, it's basically um, takes into account to the weight of the child um, in proportion to the, their height. And then you multiply, you square the height and you multiply this all by 703 and you get a percentile. 
um, you get a BMI and then you have to look at <clears throat> growth trajectories to look at what is a percentile. So um, for someone of this specific age and sex, what um, what is expected are in the high end, um, above average, or in the are they on the low lower end? Um, so just to give you an idea of what this looks like when we um, compare the children and um, and adults. Um, the, these are the BMI categories at the top. We have children. Um, so this is what would be used for children between two and 20 years of age. So these are percentiles and how they're categorized across these four um, general categories. So we have from underweight. So these would be children who would be under the fifth percentile. So meaning that of all children of that specific sex and age, they're at the very low end. So 95% of children are of um, greater height and weight than they are. Um, and then we have healthy weight um, and then overweight and then obesity, which would be above 95% percentile. And then at the bottom, we have the adult um, num values. So this would be um, the actual BMI numbers, which you probably heard of. Um, you maybe you've calculated your own BMI, but these are the general um, categories under which they um, they fall in, in the different weight statuses. Something to think about: um, there are some issues with BMI in that, um, it, especially among children, it can be unstable. Um, especially if we're um, looking at a child who may be very athletic, um, it may um, misinterpret muscle mass as weight. Um, so they may be um, assumed to be overweight when in fact it's more muscle mass that the child has. So um, these are all things that need to be taken into consideration within the context of the child and the person, right? So, um, so hopefully we'll keep that in mind as we um, continue thinking about um, overweight or obesity among children. Um, so the focus of this talk is really on overweight and obesity among children and youth with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, so um, what we like to do is kind of think about different areas that are that we know are important for overweight and obesity and consider different ways that um, specific conditions might um, contribute or might be associated with some of these um, areas. So first we start with healthy eating. We know that um, it's recommended to um, eat our fruits and vegetables that we should have at least five servings a day. Um, we should also limit those sugar sweetened beverages. Um, however, there are several conditions, um, for example, with an autism where um, it may be difficult to, um, to achieve those recommendations, right? So we know in a recent study um, that reviewed a lot of other studies, they found that between 57 and 72% of the studies or of, part of their participants reported food selectivity, restricted food selection, or food refusal among children with autism. Um, we know among um, children with Down syndrome, many may experience feeding and swallowing problems due to oral motor um, functioning um, in that study, but between 55 to 60% of children with Down syndrome experience these problems. Um, we know there may be other contributing factors such as sensory issues. So we know that among children with autism, many have very um, particular interest or um, um, may not enjoy certain textures of food or certain colors of food. So that may limit their um, their availability or their responsiveness to eating um, the recommended um, servings. Um, we know some children may experience food allergies. We know that at least within autism, uh, many children are on a gluten-free or casein-free diet. Um, there may be gastrointestinal um, issues that may impact the child's abil ability to eat or ability to eat a broad, a broad, broad range of food options. And we know among some children, they may also experience pika, which would be eating non-food items. Other common challenges that are experienced by children and families are, you know, given the some of the potential limitations in, in food selection or food availability, you know, how do we manage, you know, when children are at school, um, are they able to um, achieve 
the required food servings? Um, are they able to still um, eat healthy um, while, it's, while it's school? Um, so these are just some potential issues that can impact healthy eating among children with IDD. Um, next, we think about physical activity. We know that um, the CDC recommends at least one hour of moderate to vigorous physical activity daily. However, there are certain um, symptoms or um, conditions that could impact children um, with IDD in terms of their participation in physical activity. So we know one study found that the severity of autism symptoms was associated with decreased participation in physical activities. Um, so for example, children with autism who may have um, greater difficulties in self-regulation, it might make it really difficult for them to engage in physical activities. Um, for children and youth with Down syndrome, we see that there is a lot of variability in terms of how much physical activity they engage in. Um, and with some studies showing that they actually engage in a lot of physical activities, but it's not moderate or vigorous, it's more low intensity. And there are some reports as well that um, a lot of this really depends on the social and physical environment, right? Um, so if the child is, um, is, you know, has the social skills to participate in physical activities with other um, with their peers. So do they have the communication and social skills to, um, to form those relationships? Um, do they have the physical capacity to engage in some of those physical activities? Is a physical environment conducive or accessible to individuals who might need additional supports to engage in like recreational activities or sports? Um, some contributing factors that may um, underlie some of the limitations in physical activity can include things such as limited lung capacity, congenital heart defects, hypotonia, decreased motor functioning, poor balance. All of these things really affect the physical body, which is really important um, to really fully engage in um, physical activity. Um, some other things that have been reported by parents um, are often that many activities are not accessible, meaning that they weren't designed or weren't, um, the, the activities were not considered for children who may have different needs, such as communication needs, different physical needs. Um, and there may be limited opportunities um, for, for students to engage in these activities within the school setting or even after school options. Um, so next we think about sleep, which is a really important factor that comes into play when we think about overweight and obesity in children. So the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends um, at least eight to 10 hours for the older group of 13 to 18 year olds with slightly more hours as we go down the age range. Um, so this means that they are required to have all these hours because their body needs it to recover to um, ensure that um, they're developing appropriately or adequately for their age. However, um, we know that um, weight status has been associated with sleep duration, sleep onset times, and sleep maintenance. So children who um, may not get all of those hours um, or maybe fall asleep late in the night, um, or maybe have difficulty staying asleep. We know that this has been associated with um, increased weight. Um, so this is um, helps us understand that you know sleep is very important when we when we're thinking about overweight and obesity. And when we consider um, intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, just some examples here, we know that within autism, there is a broad range of sleep problems that have been reported. Um, um, ranging by study. So anywhere from 30 to 83% of children um, have sleep problems. And then among children with Down syndrome, it's also a very high percentage that um, experience significant sleep problems. Um, some of the contributing factors that could impact um, their ability to sleep or stay asleep include things such as allergies, acid reflux, um, medication side effects, um, changes in daily routines, and then some other issues that can come up during sleep, um, especially um, for children with IDD, include things such as sleep apnea, um, sensory issues with the bedding, with the temperature. So these would be more external things that could be addressed to help support um, sleep among children with IDD. 
So we talked a lot about some of these associated factors, um, but what is what are the rates of overweight and obesity in children with IDD? So these are just some um, general med, um, prevalence rates um, that have been reported in the literature. Um, so you'll see um, some, some conditions have very broad ranges. For example, Down syndrome has anywhere between 25 to 60% of children are reported to be overweight or obese. Um, and with an autism, we have 16 to 34% reported to be overweight or obese. Um, so a lot of these things, a lot of these prevalence rates are um, sometimes hard to disentangle because a lot of it is dependent on who the participants are, whether it's a clinical sample, whether it's based on parent report, um, whether it's based on actual um, BMI measurements, um, who the participants are. Um, but I think this gives us an idea that there is a high percentage of children with IDD who may experience overweight and obesity. Um, so this means that we need, you know, there's more research and more work that needs to be done to understand what's driving some of these values and what we can do to address, um, address these rates. Um, so now we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit. Um, so a lot of the data that we talked about so far was focused on children with IDD. Most of the studies um, were primarily based on convenience samples, so they may not reflect a lot of diver culturally diverse families and children. Um, so the focus of this project was really looking at um, Latino children with IDD. So we wanted to think about, well, what is the context in which Latino children with IDD would be growing up? And what are some of those factors that could be associated with overweight and obesity? Um, so we know this is a pressing issue because we know that Latino children make a substantial number of um, children in the United States. So for example, in Texas, we see that half of our population um, is children. Um, we also know that Latino children um, have high rates or experience high rates of, um, of poverty, um, which, you know, suggests that there are um, significant risk factors that come associated with that. For example, lower resources, lower availability of services, um, and all of those things can really um, set the stage for what types of supports are available for Latino children with IDD. Um, so next we consider some of those stressors. We know that um, among Latino children and families, there might be high levels of stress. Um, they might have a very recent migration experience, which can result in stress, anxiety, and depression. Within um, the family, there may be stressors, especially if there are multi-generational households, where there may be differences in acculturation cultural and language discordance where maybe um, family, some of the family may only speak Spanish while other uh, family members may be primarily um, English speakers. Um, and we know that there's been reports of community stressors such as experience of discrimination, poverty, bullying, and violence. So all of these things really impact that family household um, that children with IDD would grow up in. And then when we consider um, the rates of overweight and obesity among adults, Latino adults, we see that there is a high rate of um, obesity. So these are this map is the um, self-reported obesity rates um, by Hispanic adults um, from the Behavioral Risk, Risk and Factor Surveillance System, which is one of the a survey that's administered, administered through the Centers for Disease Control. Um, so you see um, all of the rates across most of the states are pretty um, pretty high up there. And in fact, in Texas, we see 41% of Hispanic adults are reported to be obese um, by self-report. Um, so this is alarming because we know that in, um, in research has shown that um, that uh, mothers who are overweight or obese tend to have children who are overweight and obese. And this can be associated with some of the um, social, cultural, environmental factors that contribute to overweight and obesity. Um, so addressing these issues is important. Um, so a recent review actually looked at Latino families and, and, and um, tried to investigate, you know, what are some of those factors that could be um, 
that could impact overweight and obesity um, among Latino families. Um, so we kind of go through the same areas that we did before with children with IDD. Um, so for example, um, you know, with healthy eating, um, there are um, different, there might be cultural um, feeding practices that promote the child to eat all of their food on their plate. Um, so if the, the plate of food is in proportion, um, isn't sized well for, um, for portions, then this may mean that children may be eating a lot more food than is necessary um, for their age. Um, and um, so, and then there's also other um, factors that kind of contribute under healthy eating. For example, many Latina moms reported that they wanted to be a good mother and that meant um, providing enough food for their children. Um, and then um, parents also reported that many of them had lower access to healthy foods, especially among households where um, they were um, um, low income or in households where they were not close enough to, um, to a supermarket. Um, in terms of physical activity, um, the, the authors found that there were high rates of inactivity among parents, and this kind of refl was reflected in the children as well. So having parents model these, this behavior would be a, a specific strategy that could help promote physical activity among children. Um, the authors also reported there were higher rates of television viewing among Latino households than um, in white households. Um, and one of the curious findings was that this was often associated with um, first generation households where parents were promoting their child viewing television because they felt that it would help their ch children learn English um, and learn how to um, learn their um, or master the English pronunciation. So they were seeing it more as an educational tool versus seeing it as a tool that might um, might impact the, the child's availability to engage in physical activity. And then for sleep, um, we see that in a separate study, they found that by two years of age, um, Latino toddlers were sleeping fewer hours compared to white children. Um, so they weren't reaching the, the expected hours as recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And then on average, school-aged children were sleeping less than nine hours a day. So this is also suggests that they're not um, receiving the sufficient number of hours that are recommended. Um, and then another, um, another reported finding was that Latino households were more likely to have um, a TV in the bedroom with a child um, than white children. So this may make TV viewing more accessible, which may impact the availability of sleep or the um, onset and duration of sleep. So, um, you know, some additional things that have been reported as common barriers by Latino families, which I think it helped um, frame the context in which um, many of these children are growing up in, um, are shown here across the different areas. So for example, for healthy eating, um, many families have reported that their proximity to a supermarket um, is a barrier to um, being able to obtain healthy, um, healthy foods, such as fruits and vegetables or fresh food. Um, food costs is another um, barrier, um, as well as um, weather-related limitations. Sorry, I think that was for the physical activities. Um, so for physical activities, there is a lack of green space. So many activities involve running, um, going on walks, um, and things like that. So having access to a park locally um, really would help facilitate our, uh, participation in physical activity. Um, Recreational activities were also limited. Um, there was also concern about neighborhood safety. So um, this would impact um, parents' comfort in terms of having their children play outside. Um, and then there were also other related limitations. For example, for families that live in the North, um, there would be concerns with the winter and snow. And what do you do when there's, you know, when it's too cold to go outside? Um, the same can, the reverse can be said here in Texas, where it's more of it's too hot outside. So what can we do indoors? Um, and then some barriers to healthy sleep um, include many families may work non-traditional work hours. So there may be a lot of shifts in caregiving that may impact 
um, children going to sleep at the same time or having a stable or a consistent um, sleep routine. So given all of these things that we've learned so far about um, children with IDD and Latino families and the limited availability of research on Latino children with IDD, um, we embarked on this study to, um, to investigate these three questions. Um, first, we wanted to um, examine what the rates of overweight and obesity among Latino children with and without IDD were. Um, we also wanted to examine um, what are some of those factors that are associated with overweight and obesity? And are there any differences across conditions? And one of the things we did with this study was we didn't um, look to compare Latino children with white children or Latino children with other racial ethnic minority children, but rather we looked specifically within Latino children. Um, the thought was that this would allow us to keep the context um, similar um, and would actually help us to, um, better disentangle what the impact of IDD was on some of these issues. So to answer these questions, um, we looked at data from the National Survey of Children's Health from 2016 to 2017. Um, this is a nationally representative survey of children between um, zero and 17 years of age. Um, parents complete the survey either over the phone or online, and they are asked a series of questions related to the child's health and the family household. For this specific study, we um, specifically focus on Latino children with and without IDD, and we focus on children who are between 10 and 17 years of age. Um, we focus on this age range because um, due to some of the um, concerns about BMI and calculating BMI for young children, um, the survey does not collect that or report that information for children under 10. So this means that we would not have BMI data, which is what we were looking at um, for any for younger children. And then overall in this, um, once we um, segmented or um, pulled this data, we had approximately 259 Latino children with IDD and 3,146 Latino children without IDD. And for IDD conditions, we um, focused on autism, developmental delay, Down syndrome, and intellectual disability. Um, we evaluated the per BMI percentile um, and exclusively focused on healthy weight, overweight, and obese. Um, and these were actually um, reported as categories. So we don't have the exact percentile, but rather whether the child was considered to be healthy weight, overweight, or obese. Um, and then in terms of associated factors, um, these are some of the things that we looked at. We were interested to see whether sex um, factored in, so whether there were differences between males and females, whether age groups would factor in, so 10 to 13 years or 14 to 17 years, um, whether functional difficulties were, um, were a concern, um, so between zero to one or two or more. Um, we also looked at parent education, so whether the parent had achieved a high school or lower education or some college or greater. And then we also looked at household income. So whether or not it was um, below 199% of the federal poverty level or above that. Um, so um, let's see. So here we first present our results from our first question, which was what is the prevalence of overweight and obesity among Latino children with and without IDD? So um, we kind of found something a little bit different than what we expected. Um, we did find high rates of overweight and obesity among Latino children without IDD. So about 41.6% of children. Um, for children with IDD, this number was actually lower at 36.4%. Um, so this suggests that um, there are high rates of, of overweight and obesity among Latino children. Um, but there isn't that much of a distinction between children with, with IDD and children without IDD. Um, next, we looked at um, what are some of those factors that are associated with overweight and obesity in Latino children with and without IDD. So this includes the entire sample. So children with autism, Down syndrome, developmental delay, and intellectual disability. So for the overall group, what did we find? Um, so um, just to kind of help frame things, 
the things that are yellow are significant. Um, and those are things that were associated with lower likelihood. Um, the blue is greater likelihood. So for example, in the first row, we see that having an IDD was associated with lower likelihood of being overweight than children without IDD. And then um, we see this similar pattern for females. Females were less likely than males to be obese. Um, we also found that older children, so those um, youth from 14 to 17 years of age, were less likely than 10 to 13 year olds to be overweight. Um, we see that um, for children with IDD who had two or more functional difficulties, they were more likely to be obese than children who had zero to one functional difficulty. And then finally, we see here with parent education that children whose parents had some college or greater, um, they were less likely to be obese than children who, um, oops, um, that, whoa. What's going on? Um, the children whose parents had um, high school or lower education. Um, <clears throat> so this kind of helps reflect a little bit more on those initial values where we saw a lower prevalence of overweight and obesity among Latino children with IDD than children with IDD. Um, so we do see that they're less likely to be overweight than Latino children without IDD. Um, and then we see some, some potential protective factors that could um, minimize the risk or minimize the likelihood of overweight and obesity in terms of um, sex, age, and parent education. Next, we present this, um, the specific results um, within each condition. So we compared, um, for example, children with autism compared to children without autism. And we see a similar pattern emerge. So um, for autism, we do see that children with Latino children with autism were less likely to be overweight than Latino children without autism. We see that that protective factor among females um, for uh, an obesity. Um, we also see that older children were less likely than younger children to be overweight. Um, and then we see the similar findings with functional difficulties. Um, so the more functional difficulties, um, the greater likelihood for obesity and the greater um, parent education, the lower likelihood for obesity. So next we see um, the kind of the same pattern emerge for developmental delay. We don't see any significant differences between children with and without developmental delay in terms of um, likelihood for overweight or obesity, um, but we do see that same protective um, factors in terms of uh, being female, older age and college education, um, and then that increased risk um, by functional difficulties. For children with Down syndrome, we see a little a different picture emerge. So we see that having Down syndrome was um, significantly more likely to be associated with overweight and obesity than children without Down syndrome. Um, and then we see similar things for, um, for fem being female, being older, um, and having parents of, with college or greater education, and the same impact, similar impact on of functional difficulties. And then finally, we see on intellectual, um, intellectual disabilities, which basically showcases a, um, a similar profile of um, being female, being um, older, and having a parent with college or greater education, and the impact of functional difficulties. Um, so just to summarize, we do see that older children were less likely to be overweight um, and obese than younger children. We see the protective factors of education. So children with parents with some college um, were less likely to be obese and children um, with parents who had high school or lower education. We see the impact of functional difficulties, which may impact the um, opportunities to engage in physical activities. So children with two or more functional difficulties were more likely to be obese than children with zero to one functional difficulty. We also see the impact of Down syndrome. So we see that children with Down syndrome were more likely to be overweight and obese than compared to children without Down syndrome. Um, and then among autism, we see that they were less likely to be overweight than children without autism. 
So, um, so overall, we did find high rates of overweight and obesity among Latino children with and without IDD. Um, so this helps us identify that overall Latino families can um, can benefit um, from perhaps more parent education um, workshops that are tailored to um, that describe um, healthy eating behaviors, healthy um, physical activity practices, um, how to improve sleep in ways that are more culturally sensitive and um, take into account the family's um, family structure and the family um, and the family routines. Um, we do see that there are some benefits to examining with thin ethnic group. Um, so we didn't compare Latino children with white children or children Latino children with other racial ethnic minority children. Um, and I think this helps us identify which factors matter for children with IDD. Um, so we could further disentangle what, what is driving some of these issues, right? So across the analyses, we didn't see an impact on um, of household income, which may mean that um, some of these things may be go above and beyond um, in terms of impacting overweight and obesity for children with IDD. Um, and we also thought it was important to look at condition specific effects. So if we had based our study solely on that first research question where we just looked at um, the overall group of IDD and Latino children without IDD, we would have thought that um, Latino children with IDD are less likely to have pure weight and obese than Latino children without IDD. However, we saw that once we look specifically within conditions, we noticed that um, that there was some um, some masking going on in terms of the prevalence rates, right? Where we saw lower likelihood for overweight and obesity or overweight for children with autism. However, this was um, this was the reverse of what we found for children with Down syndrome, right? So those different differential effects were basically erased when we collapsed the groups together. So it's important to consider um, what this means, right? So for example, for children with Down syndrome, there may be a lot more physical um, physical conditions that may impact their um, availability to engage in, in physical activities, as well as they may have physical um, constraints in terms of feeding um, and um, an oral motor um, um, use. Um, so these are specific things that could be targeted to provide more support to the child and the family. Um, <clears throat> so there are some limitations. Um, so this data reflects um, parents report um, from 2016 to 2017. Um, so this may not impact, may not really reflect um, what the state of overweight and obesity may be since COVID-19. So we know that since the um, since the pandemic began, there has been substantial um, reduction of recreational activities for children. Um, there is limited participation outside of the home for a very long time. Um, we know that there was there were a lot of some food shortages, which may have impacted healthy food options. We know that um, disproportionately Latino families have been impacted by job loss and job reductions. So this may impact the availability of resources in the household, um, not to mention the loss of family members who may have been lost due to COVID-19. Um, another thing that we did not capture in this data or in this study was uh, parent beliefs and practices. Um, so we're reporting on the prevalence of overweight and obesity and demographic characteristics of the child and the family, but we didn't have access to information about um, specific activities at home that the family may engage in um, related to physical activities or their beliefs related to food and physical activity or sleep. Um, so additional research is needed to really closely examine um, individual community and policy level changes or interventions that can be done or implemented to support these families and children with IDD so that they can in, um, improve healthy um, their health and well-being. Um, so I just wanted to conclude with some um, kind of general strategies to ensure that we're engaging in culturally informed um, processes or practices. Um, so especially among the Latino community, it's important to recognize the importance of the family system. So any interventions or supports that are created for Latino children 
with IDD must take into account the family. Um, and this may go beyond the immediate family, the, um, the parents and siblings. This may involve aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins. Um, so it may be a multifamily um, process to engage in um, promoting healthy behaviors. It's also important to examine the context of the family's culture and their level of culturation. So we know um, many studies that um, have been published on Latino families or Hispanic families, many um, have, you know, may not um, acknowledge or measure where the family is from. Um, so we may be um, having a similar issue that we did with the conditions, right? Where we're putting together families from Mexico, families from Central America, families from South America, and all of these families may have very different cultural backgrounds and very different um, practices related to food, physical activity, and sleep. So recognizing the um, heterogeneity of Latino community is important so that you're, you can um, deliver or um, align your intervention strategies in a way that is more culturally appropriate for that family. And then just some final things. Um, so we know um, with Latino families, there are a lot of social environmental um, impacts that can um, impact that can affect how they engage in health health promoting behaviors. Um, so it's important to ensure that we engage in efforts to address those social determinants of health. So um, when we're working with families or direct or interacting with families, not just focusing on the actual the intervention or the the um, service we're delivering, but really taking a more holistic approach to measuring, you know, do they have health insurance? Do they have access? Are they able to come to, um, to the clinic? Um, is their environment safe? Are there concerns about their neighborhood? Are they, um, are they, you know, um, do they have a stable job? Are they concerned about, you know, being able to pay rent? Are there other services that can help support families so that you can address or you can have the family's attention um, in addressing the issues that you're that you're um, trying to address? And then finally, just wanted to um, highlight that it's really important to build on the child and family strengths, values, and routines, um, meaning that it's really important that we take, you know, take a step out of our, out of our bubble and think about, you know, what, what helps this family function, what helps this child function, function, what are their, um, you know, how have they demonstrated resilience, how, um, how are, what are their interests, or what are the things that really um, help promote their family cohesiveness and really making sure that we are embedding those those things within interventions to ensure that whatever intervention or strategies we're promoting will be um, more successful if implemented within the family um, family system. Um, so um, so yeah, so I think um, just wanted to highlight two. Um, two projects that I'm involved in. So um, the study I presented today was part of the larger Poder project. Um, and right now we're um, focused on Latino children between six and 17 years of age and their mothers. Um, there's a couple of different opportunities to participate in this project. Um, and there's a link here where you can learn more. Um, I also direct the Aspen program, which is an intervention program directed to families of young children with autism who are between 18 months through six years of, years of age and who are in low resource households. Um, this project um, helps train parents um, on different strategies that they can use at home to promote their child's communication, play, and behavior. Um, and I've also included the link to our website here, um, which has my contact information as well, if you wanna learn more. Um, so I think that's it. So here's my email address in case you have questions, but I'm also happy to answer questions um, online right now. So thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. And um, definitely want to hear from questions from the audience. Um, and maybe Kate could help monitor that. Um, but I did want to say that um, thank you so much for doing all that background for us about, you know, the whole issue of obesity among children with IDD and, and specifically among Latino families. I mean, I think that's really important. And I think the findings are, are very unique <laughs> too. I will say with the Poder study that we're 
that we're collecting data, wrapping up our data collection on, um, we kind of found a couple things that were the opposite. So <laughs> and it, yeah. within our Latino sample. So one, we found that um, the girls were more likely to be overweight than boys mm -hmm. in our sample. And then, well, the other thing wasn't really the opposite, but you were talking about the issue of controlling behaviors of the parents, like um, making sure that they finish their plate, you know, being something that may be culturally um, mm -hmm. um, bound. And we actually found that parents who were more controlling our sample, their children's BMI uh, percentile was lower, which is interesting. Yeah. You yeah, know, so it could, I think, yeah, it's kind of the opposite think, of what's in the literature. Yeah, because I think that study was focused on just on Latino children in general. So I think we're still learning a lot about Latino children with IDD and how some of the things we've kind of um, learned or thought were the truth, right, may not be the same or may not apply to children with IDD, right? Because the whole dynamic of the family changes as well. Absolutely. Yeah, happy to hear if anyone has any. What's the best way for people to participate, Kate, as far as questions? I don't know. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A function, and I, I can read those out for you. If you would prefer to speak out, um, let me know in the chat and I can uh, unmute you. I know as a parent, as you're kind of going through and then as you're talking about following up with some of the, what could be contradictory results, um, when I hear about like uh, parents being more controlling over what their child eats, some of that I even wonder, is that more of like a controlling of overall eating habits? Like, is there less grazing and snacking in that household? You know, is, you know, what's mm -hmm. on the finisher plate because it's healthier food? Um, is that a factor? Yeah. Yeah, I think there was, um, when I was reading on, on those practices on that review, um, I think some of the controlling was to um, not allow the snacking to happen. So it's like you only eat at designated times, like you eat at lunch and you eat at dinner and there's like no in between, which they can then lead to then overeating, right? Because then you've gone, maybe gone um, a while without eating. So you're like really hungry. Um, so there were suggestions of, you know, that that may be something that to address, right, in terms of allowing for snacking, but maybe monitoring what kinds of snacks, right, so making sure that they're healthier snacks um, to then, that would then minimize the, the risk of overeating um, during mealtime. Okay, great. Uh, we do have one question in the chat. Uh, Christine would like to know, can this information be made available for educational purposes for our families that we serve in our program? Yeah, definitely. I think that's kind of one of the next steps and as part of the, the project is to, excuse me, um, create resources that can be readily disseminated to families in the community. Yeah, I mean, we could do an infographic about the findings of your study, you know, that could be disseminated mm -hmm. to families and providers. That would be really yeah, cool. and definitely in a much more family friendly way. And I can put a link to the putter study right in the chat too. Wants more information. Healthy Halloween coming up. Yep. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Activities. <laughs> That's neat, Christine. That's great. Christine, I don't know if you're able to talk a little more about that, about the healthy Halloween activities. Do you wanna? Share that with us, like verbally or in the chat. Sure. Uh, Christine, would you like me to unmute you? Or do you want to just type? OK, I'll unmute. Yeah. Hello? Hi. Yeah, hi. hi. Make sure my microphone is working. Um, Yes, um, every year I do a healthy Halloween activity uh, that caters to, of course, the theme of Halloween, but we uh, uh, derive it from healthy snacks. Um, and we focus a lot on uh, children with developmental disabilities, on focusing on motor skills, speech skills, 
communication skills. So all the activities uh, or the recipes that we put into our Healthy Halloween activities, we incorporate those types of skills. Uh, so the families learn how to do it at home. Um, but uh, of course, now going and uh, learning a lot more about uh, the obesity and then the lack of education of nutrition, I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to combine that and not only it be a fun activity, but a learning one as well on the nutrition side and health wise, health and wellness side for the family to take home mm -hmm. from. And do you represent a particular organization, Christine? Uh, yes, we're here at the City of Laredo Health Department. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have anyone else who would like to uh, ask a question or share a comment? I also want to mention, um, I placed a link in the chat if you scroll up. Um, before you exit for the day, if you could please fill out an evaluation uh, at that link. It's real short. It'll just take a minute or so um, just to give your thoughts about today's presentation. Okay. Well, if nobody else has any questions, um, I just want to say thank you again to Dr. Vanegas for coming and speaking with us today, and thank you all for coming out. And uh, next month, we are looking forward to having uh, Dr. Paul Shattuck is going to come and speak with us um, in, let's see, I just blanked on the date. I love it when I do that. Um, it is on November 6th. Yes, November 7th, Monday, November 7th at 2 p.m. Uh, so more information will be going out for about that probably next week. And uh, it will be an email and on our social media. Just to let people know, Paul Shattuck is very well known nationwide on um, transition and adult services. And I think that's what he's probably going to be talking about, right, Kate? It is, yeah, he's, it's a kind of... Uh, an overview of different aspects of his research. I don't think it's specifically on transition, um, but it, that is gonna to be touched on. Great. Yeah, I think he really focuses on, on uh, mm -hmm. adult services. So services available after transition and, and um, sort of looking at uh, policy issues as well related to that. Yeah. That's right. All right. Well, thank you all, and I hope the rest of you have a great rest of your day. All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Bye. Bye.